But some might argue that uh, Paul is referring to the fact that uh, individual Christians who make up the church are to uphold and support the truth in their daily lives as they witness for Christ and as they exemplify Christ uh, in their homes and their jobs and, and so forth. Now certainly I think this idea can be entailed to a degree in Paul's words. However, I don't believe that's the main thrust of the text. For again, Paul speaks of the church being the pillar and ground of the truth. Again, this word church refers to an assembly of believers, and it is the assembly which is the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, the focus of the text is not so much on how Christians as individuals are to uphold the truth, but instead the focus of the text is on Christians who are gathered together who are to uphold the truth. That is, Christians who gather together in an interactive, lively, Christ-centered uh, assembly to exercise their gifts and abilities and so forth. It is then during such an assembly that the truth of Christ is most accurately upheld and supported. Consider the analogy of a car. If I asked you what part of the car makes the car run, what would you say? Well, I think you would probably say the car engine. But is it an assembled engine that makes the car run, or is it simply the individual component parts of the engine that make the car run? Of course, it is the assembled engine in the car that generates the power to make the car move and operate. The constituent parts of the car engine by themselves won't power the vehicle at all. It is only when the parts are intimately assembled correctly and are working in unison and in harmony with each other that the car engine can properly function and efficiently power the car. So it is when it comes to the church in regard to uh, fulfilling its function in regard to upholding the truth. It is when all the members of the church are assembled together that the truth is most accurately and efficiently upheld. Of course the analogy of the car engine is not perfect for while individual engine parts alone can't power a car, individual Christians can and do uphold the truth of Christ to a degree. However, the question I have is, is can individual Christians alone uphold and support the truth as accurately and thoroughly as a fully functioning assembly of believers who each seek to manifest Christ to uphold the truth through their own gifts and virtues and experiences and personalities? No, they can't. Consider another analogy. Imagine you have a beautiful stained glass window which consists of dozens of uh, different colored and intricately uh, connected pieces of glass. Now what would be the best way to manifest the beauty of such a window? Would it be by shining the light through only one glass piece of the window? Or would the wonderful splendor, elegance, and, and all the colors of the window uh, be best manifested by shining light through every glass piece of the window? Well, I think the answer is obvious. The beauty of the window would be best manifested by shining light through every piece of glass in that window. So it is when it comes to manifesting and upholding the truth in the Church of Jesus Christ. You can think of the church as a beautiful spiritual stained glass window of Jesus Christ where each member is as it were a different piece of, of living glass that Christ desires to shine through. Now what would be the best way for the beauty of this window uh, to be manifested so that the truth of Christ's image and nature would be most accurately and clearly upheld? Is it by Christ you know, shining his light through only a few pieces of the window, namely the gifted teachers and orders and uh, worship team members in the body? Well, I don't, I don't think so at all. Instead, it is by Christ shining the knowledge of himself through the entire window, through all the different pieces of the window. And this is done, of course, by means of the Spirit of God working through the unique gifts virtues, experiences, and personalities of the members of the church when they assemble together and they interact with one another and they seek to edify one another in love. In summary, I believe this passage 
is one of the many New Testament texts which establishes the concept that the whole body of Christ is to be free to function and uphold the truth when the church assembles together. As I mentioned earlier, there are some that suggest that the uh, principle in this passage is fulfilled by Christians upholding the truth in their individual lives. Um, others would suggest that it's uh, fulfilled when you have only a few select men in the church who uh, teach the Word of God when the church assembles. However, I don't believe such an idea is, is derived from this passage. I don't, I don't believe it does justice to the text, to the spirit of the text. Instead, I believe this idea is, is mainly derived from hundreds of years of church tradition which has basically conditioned uh, Christians to think that only gifted orators and teachers can truly uphold God's Word and manifest Christ when the body of Christ uh, assembles. Contrary to such an idea as the Pauline doctrine as alluded to in this passage in 1 Timothy 3.15, that all Christians, uh, both men and women, they are priests before God, and they have the responsibility and the privilege to be the pillar and ground of the truth when the church assembles. Thank you, and God bless.